Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome. I'm Nazia Hassan with Foley and Lardner. I'm pleased to welcome you to today's NDI Checkpoint web conference. In this program, we address corporate philanthropy, gener generating profits, and giving back. I'd like to take a moment to introduce our program speakers for today. First, we have Frank Giardini. Frank is a principal at Grant Thornton. He advises clients in the healthcare and higher education industries on business and tax matters and provides transactional planning and tax consulting to his exempt and for-profit clients. Second, we have John Kordsmeyer. John is the president of Northwestern Mutual Foundation. John focuses on developing and implementing giving and volunteerism strategies at Northwestern Mutual. Next, we have Karin Werner. Karin is an associate and estates and trust lawyer with Foley and Lardner, focusing her practice on assisting public and private foundations on structural and operating issues, including governance, reorganizations, and grant making. Before I turn the presentation over to our speakers, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's program will last approximately one hour, followed by a short question and answer session. We encourage you to submit written questions during the program. Please type your question into the Q&A widget open on the left-hand side of your screen. We will respond to written questions at the end of the program, time permitting. The webcast console you are looking at can be completely customized. You can resize or move any of the windows that you have open, including maximizing the PowerPoint presentation on your screen. If you experience technical difficulties during the presentation, please visit the webcast help guide by clicking on the help widget below the presentation window, which is designated with a question mark icon. The PowerPoint presentation will be available on our website at foley.com in the next few days, or you can get a copy of the slides in the resource list widget. As a reminder, today's program is being recorded and will also be available on Foley's website in the next few days. Foley will apply for CLE credit after the web conference. If you did not supply your CLE information upon registration, please send an email to Nazia Hassan at N H U S A I N at Foley.com to be eligible for CLE. You will also need to log into the On24 session and answer a polling question during the program. As a final note, those seeking Kansas, New York, and New Jersey CLE credit are required to complete the attorney affirmation form in addition to the polling question that will appear during the program. A five-digit code will be announced during the presentation. Please email the form to Nazia Hassan at nhusain at foley.com immediately following the program. And now I would like to turn the presentation over to Karin. Thank you, Nazia. Um, well, we wanted to start with a couple of statistics on corporate philanthropy to get our bearings. Um, but even before that, I was looking at John's title as Nazio was speaking, and I think that's a really great way for us to start. If you look at John's title at Northwestern Mutual, he is the Vice President of Strategic Philanthropy. And that's really what we're talking about today. Um, we will give you guidance on the rules and technicalities associated with corporate philanthropy. Frank and I are well-versed in those as professionals. But John's focus really at Northwestern Mutual is how to use philanthropy to further his company's motivations, how to give back to their community, how to promote better uh, PR for the company. And so we'll talk specifically about you know, the federal rules, but also get a lot of color from John on what Northwestern Mutual is doing today, both with their company foundation that he heads up, but in lots of other areas where they're active in corporate philanthropy. So some statistics to start. Um, there are over 2,600 corporate foundations in the United States today, and they give approximately $5.5 billion a year. Uh, the companies give approximately $5.5 billion a year to those corporate foundations, and they hold that in assets. Um, 
2013 corporate giving, the statistics shows that really foundations are a subset of corporate giving. As you see there, almost half of corporate giving is cash contributions directly to charities, separate charities from the companies. Um, almost a third is cash to affiliated corporate foundations, so such as the Northwestern Mutual Foundation. Um, and then just over 20% is given non-cash contributions given directly to charities. Um, later, we'll address some of the special issues that arise when giving non-cash contributions, particularly valuation issues. Um, while corporate giving is a small subset of all charitable contributions in the U.S. each year, it's approximately 4%. Um, most is obviously coming from individuals and non-corporate foundations, typical private foundations often formed by a family. But again, we do believe that corporate philanthropy is a really great thing for most companies to consider and think about, and we'll present you with hopefully a lot of options today for different ways that it can be done. First, a couple of recent trends in corporate philanthropy in the United States. Um, pharmaceutical companies lately have been donating a lot of their product um, and instead of doing it directly to separate charities, um, they have been forming some private operating foundations, and they're using those private operating foundations to distribute the medicine to low-income patients, often abroad. Um, so this is sort of a recent um, surge in the last uh, number of years that's become sort of, you know, quite important. A lot of companies are also continuing to grow their corporate matching programs, um, you know, so again, sort of telling your employees, we will match up to a certain dollar amount in your giving to charities that you wish to support. Um, and then the last trend is something that you're seeing across corporate and nonprofit realms is sort of a blending of business with philanthropy. Um, we'll address commercial co-ventures in particular toward the very end of the presentation, but think about lots of companies that blend a profit motive with also some very significant philanthropic aims and goals and programs. Um, obviously, Northwestern Mutual will be referencing a lot today as our sort of core example, but you can think about Tom's Shoes or Patagonia or Newman's own spaghetti sauces and other products or even Target. Many companies out there that are known for the significant philanthropics that they do, often as a core part of their business strategy. Now, there are many non-tax reasons for engaging in corporate philanthropy. Um, public relations is sort of the top one, sort of thinking about generating goodwill via your philanthropy. I was reading an article this morning about the founder of Tom's Shoes, who really swears by the fact that their strong philanthropic activities have really helped to promote the business of selling Tom's Shoes across the country. Um, it can also help in boosting just employee morale in general. Obviously, the direct matching program for employees is a real way to make employees feel like they have encouragement from their company to get engaged in their community. Um, they have more power to use funds to support those charities that they really care about. And again, it can be a great employee morale and sometimes retention mechanism. Um, and then again, just general community engagement. This is an opportunity to expand the business for the company, um, develop partnerships and goodwill in the broader community. And again, oftentimes philanthropy can be a good business move as well as simply giving back and generating good PR. Karen, now, this is John. If I yes, can jump great. in at this point. Please. Just, just to go back over a couple of things. One is this issue of strategic philanthropy, and we talk about trends. There's two things that I'll mention in particular that are especially important to the Northwestern Mutual Foundation. The, you'll see in a lot of the foundations, especially the corporate foundations, an increased effort to focus resources to deliver the greatest impact. So gone are the days when a little bit of money was distributed to a lot of different organizations. And the idea here is that if in addition to your giving and your volunteer strategies, you really want to uh, be a change agent and thought leader and help drive real sustainable change in the areas you choose to focus on, it takes a, uh, a deeper level of support both financially and um, in some ways through the talent that you have in your organization to accomplish that. So that's one of the trends. And the other that Karn referred to just briefly is this idea of TOMS. 
Northwestern Mutual has taken on um, one of the trends in corporate philanthropy these days is cause branding or cause marketing. And uh, for us, that simply means that we have decided that on a national basis, childhood cancer is a cause that we want to um, make a difference in, in terms of not only raising money to support research, and not only to support uh, the individuals who choose to enter the field of research, uh, uh, but also in terms of providing support to, children, to families and children who are, are dealing with it. And the idea is that we can help build awareness of the need for philanthropic support for the cause and then drive real change. Thank you, John. That's really helpful. And again, we're hoping that John will just pop in throughout and give us some flavor and color about what Northwestern Mutual is doing. Um, turning to the tax benefits, obviously there are tax benefits to corporate philanthropy, and that is compelling for many companies. Um, the tax rule is that a company may deduct up to 10% of its taxable income in the year in which contributions are made. Um, if contributions in excess of that 10% are made in a particular year, you may carry those forward for up to five subsequent tax years. Now, statistics show a lot of companies are giving sort of 1% to 2% annually. That is sort of the top end, but of companies that are philanthropically involved, um, you know, that's a nice benchmark to shoot for. Obviously, not many companies get close to the 10% amount, but clearly there's a lot of generosity in the tax code for these deductions. Um, something we'll also be talking about is what is it that you're going to contribute? Full deduction is very obvious for cash contributions. Um, deductions for non-cash contributions, in particular stock, um, can vary, again, depending on what you are contributing. So Northwestern Mutual Foundation, I thought we'd give John a chance to give us a little bit more history and background on their foundation. Absolutely. Um, the foundation formed a 501c3 in 1992. But the reason I point that out is because our charitable giving, of course, goes back much further than that. We are nearing the 160th anniversary of the company, and we have a long history of giving. In fact, this year marks over, or um, we have been working with United Way of Greater Milwaukee and now United Way of Greater Milwaukee and Waukesha County for more than 100 years. So it's the charitable nature of what we do is not new, but the 501c3 is. We have a internal foundation board that's composed of six members, which currently include the CEO, the president of the company, um, the head of our corporate communications department, myself, and then two at-large members. The foundation has currently $108 million in assets under investment on our behalf, and our annual company, uh, the way we determine how much money we have to give is based on a formula against operating gain uh, before dividends and taxes. So uh, the company contribution on an annual basis is 25 basis points of that, and our annual giving target is set at 30 basis points, and obviously the difference that is made up hopefully is through investment returns this company, that the assets under investment on behalf of the foundation earn. So that's really a history of uh, what we do as a foundation and kind of the magnitude. So each year, or this year, our target is to give $17.4 million uh, through our foundation. Great. And do you have a goal of increasing the endowment, John? Obviously, you've got a significant sort of source of accumulated assets. Um, do you try to add more to the endowment each year or not necessarily? Um, no, we really go strictly based on the formula. We try to keep somewhere in the area of 90 to $120 million of assets under investment. And uh, the, using the formula that's there, it gives uh, predictability and a steady uh, flow and the ability for us to anticipate what those resources will be going forward. Now, going back to 1992, I, I know you said there was a long history of corporate philanthropy long before you formed the foundation. Do you have knowledge of the rationale behind forming the separate foundation at that time? Well, I'd, I'd like to say I wasn't with the company, but I have been with the company for um, almost 36 years. But actually, I, I don't know the... Um, the history behind that, I can only assume that at the time it was deemed that the benefits of forming the foundation um, provided that um, um, 
I guess, independence of the foundation, even though it's affiliated with the company. And so, mm -hmm. but that's just a guess on my part. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so matching gift programs in particular. Um, this is an area where we said it, it was a trend. Um, it's a way to motivate employees, to retain employees at time, to generate their goodwill toward their employer. Um, and certainly we are seeing growth in this area. Um, I've got Microsoft listed here as having a very successful matching gift programs. But if you do a Google search and there are many lists out there showing, it essentially is sort of, you know, top country companies in the country, GE, Ford, IBM, Merck, Target, all are known for very significant matching gift programs. Um, most of these are one-to-one -one matches up to a certain amount. Um, those around, amounts seem to range between 5000 all the way up to 50000 for sort of the, the top company. Um, but again, a good way to boost employee morale and, and encourage philanthropy from the ranks of the company. Um, John, do you have a matching gift program at Northwestern Mutual that you know of? Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. And we have a rather robust matching gift program. So we make matching gifts available not only to our employees, but also to um, the people who sell and distribute our product, uh, products on a national basis. Even though they're not employees of the company, we extend the matching gift provision to them. Now, we do it within the context of only providing matching gifts for certain causes. So okay. we have a long history of providing dollar-for-dollar dollar match for educational causes accredited, uh, schools, um, for instance, that qualify for those educational matches. Recently, we added, because we're involved in the Childhood Cancer Program, our major national partner is Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation, and we've added a dollar-for-dollar dollar match for Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation, and then we have a 50 cents on a dollar match for other family uh, support organizations for childhood cancer within certain criteria. And um, that, of course, is up to a certain limit uh, um, based on the type of role that the employee plays with the company. Yep. Great. So now we're going to jump in a bit more detail on sort of the, the laws and some of the regulations arising this and how companies can specifically structure their philanthropy. Again, we'll get into some of the particulars of what the company wishes to give. Are they giving cash, stock, employee time, or inventory? Um, different tax rules and issues apply to the valuation of those contributions. Um, Again, the issues are complex, and we will be covering as much as we can in the limited time today. But obviously, you know, Frank and I um, work in this area, and we'd be delighted to answer some follow-up questions, if any, that you may have in particular about some of these more technical aspects of the presentation. Well, now, segueing into those types of issues, and thank you, Karen. Um, when you're looking at corporate philanthropy, there's a lot of things that take place, and usually we see it in the form of cash, uh, or or when you go into more the corporate foundation environment, uh, uh, you see the gift of stock comes into play. And so the biggest issue is, you know, what is the value of the charitable contribution when there is a gift of company stock? And typically some of the major corporations, just like Northwest Mutual and some of the others, uh, Alcoa and uh, Exxon all have corporate foundations that have contributed their own stock into it. And the general answer is, you know, you can deduct the lesser of the basis of the stock or the fair market value for the charitable contribution. However, when you're dealing, generally speaking, with publicly traded stock, you know, given to a private foundation, usually it's the fair market value. So there's some great incentives, especially if the market is up and uh, and effectively, it, it makes good corporate, you know, tax planning sense. It, it, there is a lot of rhyme and reason to really blend tax planning with corporate philanthropy, and and we're provided for you really the qualifications to get that fair market value. The IRS requires, or it really defines it as qualified appreciated stock, and by that, I'll paraphrase what we have in here: is stock of a corporation for which, on the contribution date market quotes are readily available on established securities market, like New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, uh, so on and so forth, really uh, to look at the uh, provided for that the sales stock is another stipulation, would be in the form of a long-term capital gain 
if, if it was sold at fair market value. So typically that's greater than a year that we've held the stock. There are, should, should be aware of, some restrictions. If we restrictions are placed on um, uh, the contribution, you may be denied the deduction immediately until maybe those restrictions lapse. So be aware of that uh, when doing that type of planning. It's really important in the creation of it to tie the corporate tax planning in with your philanthropy plans to make sure the company maximizes from a, a two-perspective basis, the value of what it is doing. So if we move into the other type of kind of in-kind giving, I would say, and Karen, if you, Karen, yep. if you would move forward with that. Um, typically, it, you know, there's a lot of businesses, as, as Karen had indicated before, who have, let's say, you have pharmaceuticals, you have drugs, we have the local, you know, restaurant down the street could have food that it contributes to local food back. And a lot of those are created in different type of forms. Some are sole proprietorships, some are S corporations, other are partnerships. And some, there are, you know, uh, tax incentives of giving or contributing those type of items. However, it's limited to the cost basis of the donor in that product. Example would be if it costs thirty dollars to make a let's say uh, or a food product that we have from a restaurant, uh, even though we may sell it for fifty dollars, the deduction is only limited to that uh, company or and or business to only to the cost that it has thirty dollars to acquire the product. If for example, if it's food. But if you're a C corporation, a regular corporation, there's a possibility of getting a larger tax deduction than your basis. But it has to be um, into meeting certain requirements, and you need to get a written letter from a charity stating you know, that the donation meets these requirements. And I think without going through, there, the focus has to be clearly on the financial needy, the ill, infants, and really it has to really you know, segue perfectly into the donee's exempt purpose. So you need to do a lot of planning to meet those four major categories of restrictions. So, again, planning needs to be put in play to ensure that those type of things happen. I, I just want to you know, also indicate that you know, in current proposals by the Obama administration and in Congress, there are some rules of liber you know, there's some proposed legislation to liberalize these rules uh, to allow, you know, a greater frequency of char charitable contributions in this manner, in-kind type of contributions, but they're not law yet. Okay, so let's move on. The one thing I really want to give a flavor for, and, and Karin has really set the stage earlier, um, is really the type of giving that you have and really evaluating whether a, a corporate foundation type setting is the type of, you know, instrument by which, you know, your clients and or your organizations should look into. Now, typically when you make a direct charitable contribution, that is your company, your business making it, there's a there's some, you know, I would say positive things. It, it, it doesn't take a lot of administrative uh, costs and expenses to achieve it. You can make the charitable contribution directly in the form of cash or product or in-kind, as we talked about. There's, there's no exposure to, let's say, tax regulatory issues. When you do create a corporate foundation, though the, the, the foundation is going to be tax-exempt under 501c3, it is going to be considered a private foundation. And being a private foundation, we're going to be discussing these issues shortly, are subject to various excise taxes and requirements to make sure to keep that nonprofit or tax-exempt status. Um, you know, direct, as I said, is a little greater flexibility, so maybe – you know, dovetail beautifully in the way you do commercial joint venturing, possibly with the charity. The other thing that is positive, and this came through with the 1990s tax change, is the development of what's called corporate sponsorship. Corporate sponsorship is a way of a business to really support a charity and get some acknowledgement for its support. An acknowledgement could be in the use of the corporate name, 
and you've seen this a lot in the uh, university settings where you looked at, you know, various uh, stadiums that, let's say, universities have. They have, let's say, the Coca-Cola Field or the, the FedEx, uh, you know, uh, Fiesta Bowl, and these type of things are forms of corporate sponsorship where, with the use of acknowledgement of the corporate name, can get some benefit. It also provides some benefit to the business by which the expenses that they incur in the corporate sponsorship is more so what I would say marketing as opposed to charitable contribution. So again, it gives a greater flexibility and inducement really to participate in those types of events. Um, you know, we can uh, satisfy pledges uh, made by the company by, you know, and engaging them into the charitable environment. And there's a lot of flexibility in that giving, as I mentioned before. Corporate foundations, I would say, is something that an organization needs to look, you know, think long and hard before entering into because it does take into a lot of significant cost and expense to develop them and to maintain them. As I mentioned before, they're subject to excise tax could, that could be viewed to be onerous and restrictive. You can't really engage in too many ventures uh, other than the charitable giving that it's involved into, corporate sponsorship is now possible through it. It really cannot be the alter ego of, let's say, the business for which, let's say, uh, my company, XYZ Company, makes a pledge to a charity, and, and I had put created a corporate foundation. The corporate foundation cannot satisfy the pledges made by the company. It is basically its own entity, as John had indicated before. It has its own board and it operates separately apart, though it could be a way for which the corporate uh, sponsor of it can you know, get some PR, adequate PR, to show a philanthropical side to it. Um, and there's really a need for consistency of giving. It establishes a mission for which it engages into charitable things, as, as Chan has indicated. So there's less flexibility of what we can do and when we can do it. It, it really takes really careful and tax planning and really blessings from the IRS and the Attorney General's office to really alter that. Um, and with a little bit more of that, I'm going to hand it back to Karen to really get into the direct givings uh, yeah. scenarios. So we're going to give some more details now on sort of direct giving and some of the advantages and options for that versus the company foundation, the corporate foundation. And as John noted, Northwestern Mutual does and has both. Um, so they are not mutually exclusive. Um, for direct giving by the company, um, one of the things that's important is you have to decide the charitable recipient within the tax year to claim the deduction. Um, if you're funding a foundation, you can put a big chunk of money in the foundation and leave the decisions until a later date about who the ultimate charitable recipients will be from the grants out. But with direct giving, you have to decide within the year how much to give and to whom and, and pass those gifts on within the tax year for the deduction to be claimed. Um, there are issues with gifts to foreign entities. For any companies who wish to for support causes abroad, uh, the landscape gets a bit more complicated. Um, and that's something we can certainly try to address more at the end or talk about offline. But again, just being aware that gifts to foreign entities are much more complicated than gifts to United States entities. Um, Company control, you have abundant control over direct giving. Decisions are usually made by the company's board or a subset of employees regarding the contributions, and company has ultimate control. Um, also, lower costs and reporting and administrative responsibilities because, again, these are activities conducted by con company employees as part of their other roles and more general roles. Um, a negative of direct giving can be that the identity and sort of branding aspect of the philanthropy may be less powerful than using the company foundation. So funding, again, you know, there are options for what to give. You can donate cash, inventory, or stock are sort of typical options that are considered. Um, again, usually this is done on an annual basis. Um, maximum control and flexibility when you're making direct gifts because in any given year there's no obligation or expectation to make a certain amount of gifts. The company can decide based on its profits and its success and other factors for the particular year. But a negative of, of that, of course, is less consistency. 
also uh, entities won't be able to rely upon gifts um, again, and it, that can limit sort of the public relations and good business sort of aspects of the giving if it's sort of really up and down depending on the particular year. What about governance? Usually the governance is really handled by the board of directors of the company. They ultimately oversee the giving and are liable, of course, to their shareholders. And, you know, suggested sort of governance strategy here is, you know, deciding based on the size of the grant, who has the authority to make the decision. So you can see, you know, grants below a certain amount can be handled by perhaps some published public relations personnel or sort of lower or mid-level employees. Um, and then ultimately, really large grants should require board of directors approval. Um, that would be an internal sort of governance policy and structure that the company should have in hand helping to decide, again, who has the authority to approve certain charitable contributions on behalf of the company. Again, what about administration? Usually there are internal employees who are handling the administration of direct corporate gifts. Um, it can be a part of a marketing office because, again, there is good PR that comes out of philanthropy. Um, obviously, most companies have accountants and lawyers on staff who can also help with those issues related to direct company philanthropy. Um, next, we're going to turn it over to more specifics on the foundations. Okay, thank you, Karen. Uh, corporate foundations, as I mentioned to you before, are usually affiliated with, um, formed by the company to be its, its uh, what I would say alter ego to deal with a a mission or specific charity that the company so desires to really foster and develop and support. Corporate foundations, as I, you know, as I mentioned before, are Tax exempt under 501c3. So, uh, with being that, like, with, with like other, you know, uh, entities that are charitable, has to go through a formal process of approval. They're usually incorporated under the nonprofit statute of a particular state. So, again, they have articles and bylaws defining what they are and their specific missions. In fact, the IRS requires certain statutory language to be included in that in, in order as a prerequisite to obtain exemption. Typically, they have to file a Form 1023, which is an application for exemption. However, uh, unlike public charities, um, private foundations are unique in that they usually don't have a broad base of public support, so they're really being funded by a, a single or limited sources of, of the public. In the case of a corporate foundation, usually funding comes from the corporation. But private foundations are, and corporate foundations are basically the same. I mean, you've seen a lot in the news of late the Gates Foundation, the Templeton Foundation, and the, and the Annenberg Foundation. Usually, you know, well, uh, wealthy individuals create foundations to be, again, the similar type of characteristics and the similar uh, role to really create an alter ego for themselves to deal in the charitable environment. The corporate foundation is that equivalent uh, to those, you know, large mega foundations that wealthy individuals do, you know, create. They have their own board, and, and I'll, I'll segue back to John in, in, in understanding the makeup of the board, but because they are a unique and separate organization, they can't, you know, they could have some representation from the corporate side, but it's also very much important, as we will get into, having really representation, you know, uh, of the community, uh, of the uh, you know the charities in which they, or the uh, exempt area that they would like support to really gain credence to knowing where the money should go to. So if they have uh, certain independent board members that uh, are, let's say, in the health area, and the focus of the corporate foundation will be in the health area, they can help guide the foundation to effectively making the maximize the benefit and the, and the contributions it will make into that uh, charitable area. It does, you know, have certain now bells and whistles and annual requirements of, you know, from a perspective of an audit, if, it, if, if, if its size is large enough, various states require a full-fledged financial audit. And in addition to that, it has to file a, an informational return, which is called a 990PF, 
with the IRS, and it may be required uh, to file with the Attorney General uh, office of the particular state in which it is operating in or where it's solicited. If, solicited, if it does solicit some contributions uh, in those states where it does that. As I said, it, it, the board oversees the foundation, but usually a well-structured, well-oiled uh, foundation typically um, it has its own uh, in set of individuals who are experienced in the management uh, of a, an exempt organization in the charitable giving area uh, to do that. John, do you want to have any comments on really the formation of that? Do you want to sure. uh, give some input there? At, well, at Northwestern Mutual, our structure right now is a little bit different from that, but um, I, as the president of the foundation, am, of course, representing the interest of the nonprofits that we fund, but I have program officers that work with the foundation, so these are individuals that, for instance, I have someone in charge of our education portfolio, some that, that works with our neighborhood portfolio, one that works with our uh, uh, investment, not investments, but our gifts to cultural institutions in town, and they have deep relationships in the nonprofit community with organizations, and so we feel very much like that we have the voice of the community in mind as we make independent recommendations as a foundation up to the board. And uh, I will tell you that the board has been and is um, – very good about honoring the recommendations that come from the members of the foundation to the corporation in terms of the type of things that we decide to support and that they then endorse. Very good. Um, let's go look into typically how a corporation, uh, a corporate foundation is funded. And typically the, the major impetus, especially for a, a public company, funding is usually achieved through the use of company stock. Um, and as I have mentioned before, if the company has publicly traded stock, it can claim a, fair market value, a charitable contribution equal to the fair market value of the stock at the date of the contribution. If it's not publicly traded, then that's really a more difficult situation to go through and an analysis has to be made because, as I indicated before, the IRS requires, it gives you a limitation on the charitable deduction either of the lesser of the basis in the stock or the fair market value of the stock at the date of the gift. There are certain also gauntlets that we have to go through. I mean, there is a, as I mentioned before, being a, a charitable organization under the IRS, either as a public charity or a private foundation, you know, has certain limits as to who is deriving benefit. You know, there is a prohibition against inuring to the benefit of a private individual or concern. And when we do have a corporate foundation, a private foundation, and I will continue saying that, the, you know, the IRS is going to look closely in the transactions that occur between the corporate foundation and the company that's donating the stock. And these self-dealing regulations prohibit the corporate foundation from purchasing the stock from a related entity. So, again, we need to be careful of the transactions that need to go through. The corporate foundation, however, may contribute to stock options to a public charity in which, you know, let's say that charity then exercises those stock options. So when we're dealing with our stock or when we're looking at transactions that are relationships between us and the really corporation that we is our alter ego, we need to be careful. Sale of the company stock by the corporate foundation can also trigger self-dealing issues. And there are restrictions on our ability to really sell the stock back to the company. However, there are certain exceptions, and clearly is if the corporate foundation receives fair market value and the terms and conditions of the sale are you know, similar to other you know, shareholders or other class of stockholders that own the company stock. So as you can see, the way in which uh, the corporate foundation has to deal with the corporation that it's sponsor is things need to be conducted truly on an arm's length relationship. So when we look at corporate foundation, 
Um, the other funding mechanisms and questions that come into is whether or not we create an endowment or do we fund annually. And 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 as you now Karen was saying uh, earlier. When a company looks at what it needs to do and when it does in regards to charitable giving, it usually does it at the board of direct level, and they look at creating of budgets and dealing with that. So when, the, when that sponsoring corporation looks to create a corporate foundation, it usually at the front end decides whether or not it's going to endow a substantial amount of, let's say, net worth into the corporate foundation, so it can build upon that and have the necessary funding base to fund the charitable giving. So when it looks at that, it's really going to determine, you know, a large, you know, contribution to it vis-a-vis stock contribution, which is going to be funded by dividends, or a combination of a large cash uh, contribution from the get-go to fund the operations. So it creates an endowment. Typically, those type of gifts are irrevocable, meaning they can't come back to the company. So clearly, it takes a lot of forethought and planning to say, this is what we're going to do. Some of the requirements that a private foundation has to do, on an annual basis, it is required to distribute 5% of its net worth annually in the form of distribution. So when we get back to how we plan and what we need to do to maintain our, our tax exempt and, not, and private foundation status, we're going to, and avoid excise taxes that is going to be, you know, monetarily uh, punishment to us. We really need to have careful planning and how we do this. Um, and again, the net investment income when we have an endowment and we're making those dividends is uh, an excise tax that we're going to be subject to is really a one percent or two percent. Uh, excise tax, and that that varies based on the amount of charitable giving we have in a year, on the net investment income we accumulate. So this is really typically an annual cost that those types of foundations that have created an endowment have to bear, and that's money being paid over to the IRS. And Go ahead. Sorry, if if I may jump in, I was just going to reference back to John and Northwestern Mutual because it seems that, again, they're doing a combination of this planning. They've got an endowment accumulated, but they also have a mechanism for annual funding. John, do you mind commenting on that? No, that's exactly right. So, um, and but um, the considerations that Frank shared about annual funding, of course, drive the decisions that we make, right, in terms of the limits of the amount of the money that you can donate and that type of thing. So we do function in both worlds but are very mindful of what's required of us. And and I would say on the annual funding side, just based on experience, I see those smaller corporate foundations that really we we have a startup corporation that really wants to be philanthropic. You know, it, it doesn't have the ability to give that much net worth in may fund at least on the from the get go the corporate foundation on an annual basis. And as assets grow and the wealth of the corporation and its stocks grow, it may then supplement that from an endowment. So you see different corporate foundations and different you know stages of evolution really comes into play. So And then clearly in the case of John's foundation, it's really a combination really comes into play. Um, corporate governance, I think John touched upon some of this. You know, we in, we are a separate entity. As I mentioned, we have our own board of directors. You know, it, like any other corporate form, the IRS and really the attorney generals of the various states are wanting to make sure that these foundations take responsibility, fiduciary responsibility in the conduct of business at the foundation to ensure that the monies that it has are dedicated to the charitable purposes and missions that are stated. So they look to the board really to be proactive in the management of that organization. So really, you know, putting the very, you know, Sir Baines Oxley type steps in, in managing is now becoming more and more an acronym in the, in the not-for-profit world. Board size vary from a minimum to three to some, some very large corporate foundations. Depends on the complexities and the issues there. And, and, and John, from that standpoint, you know, what is the discussion at Northwestern in regards to, you know, how you look at size and, and dealing with that? Is there any pressure points of expanding the board or uh, – from from perspective of operations, can you give some insights there? 
Of course. And I should share a little bit of historical background in this regard, too. From 1992 until 2011, the uh, foundation uh, had a reporting relationship through the Human Resources Committee of our uh, Board of Trustees. In November of 2011, an inter uh, the uh, decision was made that we would create an internal uh, board that I described previously. So the reason I'm sharing that is that board has only been in place now for a little over three years. And so the size from the beginning was set at six, and there has been no pressure, no question one way or the other about whether we needed to change the size of that board to this point. Okay. A couple other Just points I want I, I, go Karen, I was just going to jump in. We got a pertinent question online. Um, one of the questions was the individuals that John was describing as handling the day-to-day -day activities yes. of the foundation, are those employees of the foundation or employees of the company? These are actually, uh, in terms of the salaries, they are employees of the company. So I know in the material there was a reference to the fact and those employees more or less than are um, um, act as volunteers through the foundation to do the work mm -hmm. of the foundation. Mm -hmm. Which is a good planning point, and, I, and, um, and we're going to touch upon that shortly. Um, the, the other thing just to consider in governance is boards may be perpetual in their existence, so the board can stay there in place uh, until they resign. Others have term limits uh, in, in regards to that. So you know, a lot of them are, you know, envisioning to keep the vitality of the board. Maybe term limits is a good thing. Um, so when you look at the composition, you really need to look to see what keeps good and fresh ideas moving along in that area. Um, so we go to the board compensation piece. As John had indicated, you know, a lot of them have company staff and management, many current and retired, to kind of keep continuity and focus of what was the mission before and what should be the mission. Uh, again, many individuals have no business connection with the company could be there. And I see that really as a big positive, especially if they're involved in the specific area, uh, a charitable area in which the corporate foundation wants to focus. It, it helps vet out what issues and where should the money be spent and where can the organization do the best. When you look at shared resources, if we can move forward, um, we need to be careful. And as John had indicated, a lot of the resources that he has are volunteers. We suggest to avoid these self-dealing rules that could be you know, harmful and monetarily damaging to the foundation. What we say is to say, you know, have the facilities, if we're in the company's facilities, to have the support and the use of the facilities free. We want to make sure that that's documented uh, so that, you know, there is clear and transparent to both entities and, more importantly, to the regulatory authorities, whether to the IRS or the Attorney General, of the way we're maintaining ourselves. So we really want to be transparent. We want to make sure also that there's fair, if there are some amounts being charged for some administrative type of services, that they are really, you know, tracked by time allocation, record keeping, and making sure periodic billing, and also showing that the amount being charged is no more than cost. It's preferable to be free and gratuitous, but if there's something because of, you know, economic pressures, cost would be fine. But again, that is an area that the IRS looks real closely in regards to the relationship between a you know a donor and the private foundation that they create. Yep. And um, there are some very particular IRS rulings out there on this front showing how detailed do they expect these records to be if you're going to be allocating costs to a related charitable entity. So and, and that's, definitely an and area that's, to be careful. The truly, truly, it's a big area. When we mentioned the ban on self-dealing, self-dealing um, is prohibited. So it could cause revocation of the exemption. Namely, I haven't seen this on the surface, but that's all, an ultimate you know, uh, penalty that could come into play where the IRS gets satisfaction and really gives education if, if it discovers a self-dealing transaction, is the onerous penalties as you can see, that are provided on the benefit, 10% of the initial tax, but if it's not resolved and not cured, it could go up to 200% of the value of the transaction. Clearly, the, the people that you need to look at 
uh, in related to direct or indirect you know, transactions between the corporate foundation and what the IRS describes as disqualified individuals. Disqualified individuals would be directors and officers of the foundations, substantial contributors of the foundation, and in this case would be the company. So again, where I had mentioned before, you know, a, a foundation covering or satisfying a pledge that the company made is a no-no. And honestly, in, in my practice, and Karin, I don't know about you, but I've seen a lot that happen. Sure, And that's Absolutely. because of poor education. Also, the foundation not can provide substantial benefits uh, to disqualified persons. For example, you know, it, it may be contributing to, uh, you know, things that it gets tickets for, and then it passes the tickets out to, uh, you know, member, you know, employees of the uh, of the corporation to attend. That will be a no-no. And the IRS and their and their agents really get into the nooks and crannies of relationships and scan the general ledgers. Uh, of the foundation, uh, and you know, and can cross over to the corporation in looking at that. And again, uh, that's why most companies that form corporate foundations still do direct giving. Part of it is to avoid some of these self-dealing issues. So every company buys tickets to galas. Well, they should do that directly instead of through the corporate foundation. And in the, when we get to the next slide, which is shared employees to avoid redundancy in, in, in how we're presenting this. When we ever have shared employees, it is important that we are transparent, that if, if the person is an employee of the corporation, they have a life and direction there. Clearly, we don't want situations where it is, you know, they're, they're wearing two hats at the same time. If they're volunteering the time, we can do that, you know, and, and I think John, I'll, uh, I'll kind of segue to you uh, in a little to ask what, what your insights here. But, again, documentation, uh, contracts that spell out the terms and conditions and how we deal with intercompany and uh, company you know, and, and corporate foundation environments are important so that we can show, uh, again, everyone that these two organizations are separate in part. Uh, they run autonomously, and there is no benefit that's transpiring or clicking back to the corporate sponsor here in this in this regard. Um, John, any commentary on this piece? Yeah, I, and I, I think that's right, and I think it's very important. So what I would tell you is that the employees, although um, their pay is from the company side or the corporate side of the business, who um, my description of them as being volunteers on the part of the company just means that they function independently. So they do not have business responsibilities outside of that of the foundation. So more or less, these folks are working full-time in the interest of and benefit of the foundation under the rules that guide corporate foundations, the rules and laws that guide uh, corporate foundations. So uh, we avoid that uh, that. Um, uh, conflict that might exist if they were trying to wear both hats. Yes, and 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 really, this now allows us to move on to to, uh, uh, to some of the other limitations. I mean, we cannot. The corporate foundation is limited in uh, in, uh, in in how much investment it could have in a particular company. So clearly, it cannot own a company per se. It has limitations generally of twenty percent of stock of a business per, and there's also a period of time for where it needs to dispose of excess business holdings to avoid significant excise taxes uh, that could be of a penalty to it for doing so. So managing that is very key. Um, but, uh, so if you decided to fund a company foundation with a bunch of stock and you perhaps exceeded the 20% limitation at that time, you do have a number of years. It's, again, it's a five-year period with a potential five-year extension to dispose of the stock to not run afoul of these rules. Okay. Um, can, let's, let's, I know we're coming short on the time, but uh, we have a CLE uh, question here. Um, yep. I bl uh, at this time, I'm going to read the CLE code for this program. If you are in need of CLE credit today, please enter this five-digit code into the poll question screen after it is announced and press the Submit button. The code is 
3209V. Again, that is the number 3, the number 2, the number 0, the number 9, and the letter V as in Victor. 3209V. Again, if you are seeking CLE credit for this session, please complete the polling question by entering the code that was just announced. The polling question will remain open briefly. For those seeking Kansas, New York, and New Jersey CLE credit, in addition to the polling question, you will need to complete the attorney affirmation form and return it immediately following the program. A copy of the form can be found in the resource list widget. At this time, the poll is now closed. I would like to return the program to our speakers. Thanks, Nazia. So just a couple items that we wanted to end with. A great corporate foundation alternative to be aware of is the Donor Advised Fund. Um, this is a separate fund created and held at a public charity, often a community foundation. Here in Milwaukee, we have the Greater Milwaukee Foundation. There are also many banks who have formed charitable affiliates who house donor advised funds. Um, Schwab, Vanguard, Fidelity are some of the leaders in the field. And I should say that I've done some research recently and they are very willing to accept more unusual items these days, such as stock options and other types of interests that can be harder to contribute charitably. Um, they've got significant depth of staff to help assess those issues and accept more unusual contributions. Um, but in many ways, they can function like a private foundation. You can use a name for the fund that uses the company name. Um, technically, you lose legal control once the gift is made to the donor advised fund. But then it does act like a private foundation in that the ongoing years you make suggestions about how to give out grants and which entities to give those grants to. Um, another thing that we wanted to just cover again is a growth area for many businesses, again, are engaging in commercial co-ventures. Um, and we just wanted to highlight that there is increasing um, regulation by states in particular it, through their charitable solicitation statutes. And in many cases, they require not only registration, but contracts to be submitted to the state and annual filings and reports on commercial co-ventures. So examples of this are, you know, buy a Tom's shoe, the one-for-one -one donation. You buy one pair of shoes from us and we will donate one pair of shoes to needy children. Um, or YoPlay, buy a YoPlay yogurt and we will donate 10% or 10 cents per yogurt purchased um, to the Susan G. Komen for the Cure Fund. Um, again, there are examples of company ha companies having run afoul of these rules. For example, back in 1999, YoPlay did a promotion where they said they would pay 50 cents per yogurt donated um, to a charity and they had a maximum amount limit of $100,000. Well, it was so successful, many more yogurts were purchased, they quickly surpassed that maximum charitable contribution, and there was no proper disclosure of that limit on their charitable giving in their advertisements and in the materials. And so now companies who are engaging in this, again, just need to be very careful that it's not in any way false advertising but that it gives the proper information to people about the charitable contribution that will ultimately be made. Um, well, we're running out of time, and we know that a number of you ask questions. Just a quick reference, remember to substantiate. There are substantiation requirements. They increase in complexity based on the amount contributed and the type of item contributed, so be aware of those rules and keep appropriate records. Um, we've also received a number of questions from you. We'll cover a couple of them in the next minute, and then if we don't get to your question, we will try to follow up with you um, via email after the presentation. So question number one for John, do you have firewalls between Northwestern Mutual's core business and the foundation? Yes, and of course I think much of the conversation that we've had today has gone a long way at addressing how those firewalls exist. Obviously, uh, the other point I should mention is that we have our corporate legal counsel serves as secretary to our foundation board so that um, we can make sure that we're maintaining that right separation between the work of the corporation and the work of the foundation. Another question for John. Are the employee gift matches made by the company foundation or are they made through direct gifts from the corporation? Yeah, that's an interesting question. The matching gifts are made um, 
um, through the foundation. I will say, though, that um, there are a thousand different, not a thousand, but there are many different models of this. There are many organizations that the matching gift program actually resides in their human resources department or a different department and, and those matches are made. So the answer is it can operate in both ways. In our particular case, matching gifts is administered through a third party administrator um, that we contract with, but uh, th uh, the foundation does that work. Okay. Uh, and another question for John, is the foundation treated as a subsidiary of the company? Yeah, that's a legal technicality that I can't speak to, but my guess is the I mean my suggestion is the answer is no. I would I would agree with that John. Typically they it's just the whole purpose is that the a non-profit organization is separate and apart exactly uh, from from the uh, corporate uh, sponsor. So it, it they need to operate as such too. That's right. Okay, well, we are out of time. Um, contact information is here on the presentation if you wish to contact any of us directly. And thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you.